How you may have noticed that the pastor and most of his family is not here. <coughs> I mean, I. Uh, but uh, they're actually down in Dallas right now, uh, headed to the Southern Baptist Convention. So um, if you think about it, keep them in your prayers as they're making all those great decisions that they do at the convention. Uh, uh, if you'll join this morning into turning into 1 John chapter 1, that's where our message is going to be this morning. 1 John 1, 8 through 9. 1 John 1, 9 is often referred to as, by our pastor a lot, but as the spiritual bar of soap. Uh, it, it goes into forgiveness. It shows the forgiveness of God and the grace that he has. And that's what we're going to be learning about this morning and diving into. So if you found your spot in 1 John chapter 1, verse 8, uh, go ahead and join me in standing and reading. If we say that we have no sin, we are deceiving ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and righteous to forgive us our sins, and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar, and his word is not in us. Lord, we come to you again this morning. God, be with my mouth. Be with the, this message. Let it not be of me. Let it not be something I'm doing to make me look good, Lord. This is all about you. This is all your word. Lord, let this message be straight from you and let the people be, have the discernment and soft, tender heart to feel the Spirit provoking them for whatever it is we need to tell them, Lord. Rest us all in your name. Amen. 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 If we say that we have no sin, we are deceiving ourselves, and the truth is not in us. So the first thing we need to know about this is that we need to recognize that we are sinners. Um, that's, that's a pretty big accusation. And if we're going to make that accusation, let's first define what sin is. So what is sin? Well, originally, it was a term used in archery. Um, you'd have your target set up, and you'd have the bullseye, and three rings around this bullseye, and each ring represented a sin, um, sin in a, uh, relation to the bullseye. So the first ring would be sin one, the second is sin two, and the third is sin three. And as the archer would shoot his arrow, wherever that la arrow landed on the target, that would be his sin in relation to the bullseye. Sin means missing the mark. Um, when it's talked about in scripture, it is talking about missing the mark of God's standards, God's expectations. So God's expectations are holiness. It's perfection. That was his expectation that we see in the Garden of Eden. Um, be holy for I am holy. The scripture tells us that. Um, and that's why we need to realize that we are all sinners. We have all missed the mark of God's per perfection, his standards. Um, we've fallen short of that line. So if we have fallen short of that line, if we are all sinners, what do we need to know about sin? Um, my parents taught me a lot of things over the years. Uh, but one thing that I was stuck as a kid was that they would say, they would tell me sin hurts. Um, whenever I would make foolish decisions, whenever I would disobey, um, there would always be a consequence of that. They'd sit me down and explain to me what I did. They'd explain to me how I sinned, why I'm receiving the consequence that I'm getting, and tell me that sin hurts. It hurts you. It hurts you that sin, and it hurts everyone around you. It, many people, too many people walk through life thinking that the decisions they make only affect themselves. That's not how life works. It's, it's, every decision you make affects the people around you. It's like the idea if you have a stone and you throw it into a lake. You see the stone hit the surface of the water, fall beneath, and then you see the ripples. You see the effect of that stone. You see it all across the lake. Well, there's more to it than just what meets the eye on the surface. Because as you throw that rock in, as it falls beneath the surface, it, is still, it still continues to sink. And that rock moves the water as it falls all the way down, and it changes the whole environment of the lake. You have, it, as, as it drops, it shifts the water around, and everything living around that water now has to adapt to the change in that environment. As the rock continues to sink, it continues to move that water, and eventually it hits the ground and brings the dust up underneath the ground. Whatever was living at that ground, the ground is now shifted, and it has to, whatever was living there has to adapt to the change in the environment. 
It's the same way with life. The decisions you make affect the people around you. If I have a bad attitude towards my dad, it's going to change his whole entire day. It doesn't matter what it's about. It may not even be towards him, but if I have that bad attitude, he is going to see that. And now I have to change his day because of the effect that I had on him with my bad attitude. So not only did my bad, bad attitude change my day, it's not going to be as great of a day for me in my opinion, but now it affects my dad too. And not only does it affect my dad, but whoever my dad talks to, it's going to affect that too because now he may not have the best attitude because of my bad attitude. Um, the choices you make affect everyone around you. Uh, what else do we need to know about sin? Well, sin has no measurements. Every time it's talked about in scripture, when it's talking about a person's sin, sin is a singular word. It doesn't talk about a person's sins, it talks about their sin. Um, here we see our sins, because it's a collective group of people, it's all of our sins. But that sin is still a singular thing, which means that sin doesn't have measurements. That means if you steal a cookie, it's the exact same measurement of sin as robbing a bank. That means if you speed down the highway, it's the exact same sin as committing a murder. The, the Bible tells us to submit to the authority that the government has placed on us um, and the authority that God has placed before you. However, there are laws that say that you should follow the flow of traffic. So. Just throwing that out there. But um, so the sin doesn't have measurements. But that's 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 a good thing though. Because saying that sin has no measurements means that forgiveness also has no measurements. That we'll get in, we'll get into that a little bit later. So we need to realize that all have sinned. If we say that we have no sin, we are deceiving ourselves the truth is not lies. That means everyone has sinned. No one has hit God's perfect mark, no one has met his standards. If you think you have met God's standards, this verse clearly tells us you're lying to yourself. The word that's used here is deceiving. You're kidding yourself. You're just digging yourself a bigger hole, and you aren't able to move on. The first step in this is realizing you sin. If you can't realize that, there's no moving on. <clears throat> so what are the effects of sin? If we all are sinful, if we all have sinned, what are the effects of sin? <coughs> well, there are short-term effects, there are long-term effects. Short-term effects may include pain, may include hurt, destruction, change. A lot of times sin can be fun though. That's why we continue to do it. Sin has, it's like, it's like, a, <coughs> it's like a shell, a silver lining around sin. And around this sin, it's great, it's fun, it's awesome. But behind, once you get past that, you have the ugliness of what sin truly is. And that's when hurt comes in. That's when pain comes in. Change. Destruction. But the long-term effect of sin, and the immediate effect of sin, is death. The wages of sin is death. Eternal death. Physical death. Complete separation from Christ. If you, since we have all sin, we all deserve that death. That separation from Christ. We need to realize that we can't handle sin on our own, though. If we, all, if we all have sin, how are we going to deal with this sin? We can't do it by ourselves. There's nothing we can do to pay for our sin. We've already messed it up. Only God was able to meet his perfect standards. So he did and died in our place um, through Jesus Christ. And he, he did this so that we don't have to take sin on for ourselves. He gave us the option to live with him if we had faith. Acts 10.33 says, Of him all the prophets bear witness, that through his name everyone who believes in him receives forgiveness of sin. If we say that we have no sin, we are deceiving ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sin, he is faithful and righteous to forgive us our sin, and to clean or cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So what we need to realize, the first thing we need to realize is that we all sin. We, ha we all have sin. The second thing is we need to realize that there is a hope from sin. Our hope is found in Christ because he was the one who took on sin. Because of his death on the cross, it allowed us the opportunity to not take on that death and gain instead of eternal life. You see through Christ's death, he took on all the sin of the world. When he died on that cross, 
All sin from everyone was placed on him so that we don't have to bear that anymore. Through the resurrection of Christ, he triumphed over death, he defeated sin, and when he returns, he will eradicate sin altogether. But through the death and resurrection, we are offered life. Romans 10, 9 and 10 says that if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart a person believes, resulting in righteousness, and with the mouth, confession, resulting in salvation. But you cannot first receive forgiveness except through salvation. If you don't have salvation, you don't have forgiveness and cannot truly understand forgiveness. Although even with salvation, you will still be tempted. You will be tempted to sin. But Jesus, Jesus was also tempted. And if Jesus was tempted, that means we're also going to be tempted because we're not better than Christ. Not. If, if you think you are, good luck, um, because you're not. Um, but temptation itself is not sin, because Jesus did not sin, and he was tempted, which means temptation can't be sin. There's always a way of escape out of temptation. Yes, you're going to be tempted. Yes, it, it happens. But you don't have to fall into that temptation of sin. God will always provide a way of escape. 1 Corinthians 10.13 says, No temptation has overtaken you, except what is common to man. God is faithful, and he will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you can bear. But with the temptation, he will also provide a way of escape so that you are able to bear it. What this verse is saying, temptation is going to happen. It, 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 it's going to happen. You're going to have times in your life where it's going to be hard. It's going to be tough. Even if you're saved, that doesn't take you away from temptation because temptation is placed there for a reason. Um, this verse also says you'll have a way of escape out of temptation. It says right there, it says, God is faithful. He will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you can bear, but with the temptation, he will also provide a way of escape so that you are able to bear it. He's going to give you that option, that, that free will, that choice to escape the temptation so you don't have to fall into sin. Um, what this verse is not saying, God will never give you more than you can handle. This verse does not say that. That's not what this verse is saying. That's a, that's a very common phrase that is way off base. God will give you more than you can't handle. God will give you more than you can't handle, more times than you realize, and more times than you would necessarily like. But he does it so that we have to rely on Christ. He does it so that you have to fall back on Christ. Because if you rely on yourself, the only thing you're doing is focusing on yourself. And if you're focusing on yourself and you can get through life, fine, we don't need God. But that's not the case. God puts those temptations in as a result of free will, the choice to follow God or follow the world. You see, I was explaining to my friend earlier this week um, how consequences, how, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, circumstances don't have to dictate your life. There, uh, there will be times where Christ will give you tough circumstances. Um, <clears throat> if God allows trials to come into your life, awesome, great, that's awesome. If he allows your life to work the way that you may want it to go, awesome, that's great. Um, but I don't have to let circumstances dictate the way I live my life. It may get hard. It may get upsetting. But when I get to the point where I have nowhere left to turn except to the cross, except to God, except to Christ, those are the best circumstances because those are the circumstances that will strengthen your walk with God. If you're not focused on God, you cannot grow to be more like God. Um, Temptation is allowed to show us that we still have free will. Our free will has been extended through salvation. We are completely free from sin if you are saved. If, if you have received salvation, you are completely free of sin. You don't have to live there. You will feel, you, we will still fall into sin. But because Christ died, we don't have to walk in sin. We don't have to live in that sin. Sin is like a distraction off the path of righteousness. Um... My dog, uh, Knight, likes to go outside with me when he's not 
barricaded by the fence. Usually, usually he's let outside and he can run on the fence all he wants. But when he comes outside with me, outside the fence, he enjoys that more. He'll follow me. He'll go around. He knows his boundaries. He knows he can't go past the tree line or the, fr the, fr the fence line up front. He's not allowed to go there, so he won't. He'll follow me. However, when he sees another dog or a rabbit trot the lawn in our yard and sees it run outside the boundaries, he'll look at that and his eyes will get wide. And he'll look up at me and I'll look and I'll see the rabbit and I'll say, nice stick, don't, don't go for it. And then he looks at me and he looks at that rabbit and he'll look at me and he'll huff a little bit of the rabbit. Night, follow me, come on, let's go. In that moment, he has a decision to make, as silly as it may sound. He has a decision to follow the words of his master, to stay within the boundaries that have been set up for him, or chase after this distraction. It's the exact same way in our Christian life. As we're following the path of righteousness, following our master, we see these distractions of sin. We see sin, how it looks oh so fun, and we see it and we're like, oh man, I want to chase it, I want to get it. And we look at our master, and our master's saying, come follow me, don't go after that. Because all it brings is pain. But we look at the sin and we look back. And in that, in that moment, we have the choice to make. We have the choice to chase after the distraction or follow the words of our master and be saved. Sin is a distraction on the path of righteousness. Galatians 5.13 says, For you were called to be free. Only do not use this freedom as an opportunity for the flesh, but serve one another through love. Since we are free from sin, we don't have to, nor should we seek fleshly desires. We aren't to go sin just because we can. If you truly have faith in Christ, and you truly desire to follow Him the way that you were designed to, then you will see sin for what it truly is, and willingly serve and follow God over what the world offers. Although there are many times we will be tempted to sin, we need to rely on Christ and find a way to escape temptation. When Jesus was tempted, every single time, He was tempted three times in the wilderness. Every single time, He counteracted the temptation with Scripture. So if Jesus Christ himself relied on the word, <coughs> shouldn't we also rely on the word? John 1.1 1, 1 says, In the beginning was the word, the word was with God, and the word was God. The word is Christ. The word is God. We need to rely on God to help us through the times of trials, in the times of hurt, in the times of pain. We need to rely on God because he is the one that has us held in his hands through salvation. There have been many times that I have been tempted to sin. Uh, a lot of times in the school. Um, so one of the things we need to realize is when we fall into sin, if we confess our sin to Christ, He will forgive us our sin. We read that in verse 9. It says, if we confess our sins, He is faithful and righteous to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So there have been many times in the school system, um, when I've been at school, where... There have, been, uh, there have been opportunities for me to disobey, disobey the teachers, the coaches, whatever it was, and my classmates and my teammates around are all doing the disobedient act of not doing what the teacher says. Um, there have been times where I have done the disobedient act of God never made for that, but there have been times where I haven't, and my teammates, my classmates tell me, dude, you're weak. What, what, what are you doing? You're afraid. What, are you, you're afraid you're going to get in trouble? It's hard. It, it's, it's hard. But the reality is, 2 Corinthians 12, 9 and 10 says this. But he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for power is perfected in weakness. Therefore, I will most gladly boast all the more about my weaknesses, so that Christ's power may reside in me. So I take pleasure in weakness, insults, catastrophes, persecutions, and in pressures because of Christ. For when I am weak, then I am strong. Here's the thing. It takes a lot more guts to do what God says than what it does to, t to do what the world says. Um, if you accept what temptation offers, that's the easy way out. It's the easy way out. And it causes more pain. It's so much harder to follow God. I heard it explained this, this way at one time. You, you see the two paths. You see the path of sin and you see the path of godliness. And in this path of sin, you see light. You see easy, you see roses, flowers, sun, sunshine and rainbows, all the way down this path. But if you choose to walk that path, eventually it will change. 
It will change into darkness. It will change into sorrow. It will change into hurt. And down the path of godliness, you see, you see um, difficult, you see difficult tasks, you see um, hardships, you see trials. But as you fight through those trials, as you push through it, you see love, you see, you see hope, you see joy. Um, Christ died so that we don't have to live in sin. That's the fifth thing we need to realize. When we are saved, we don't have to live in our sin because it has already been taken care of for us. It has been taken care of on the cross. God offers us forgiveness. We need to realize something about God's forgiveness. We need to realize first that God's forgiveness has no limit. All sin is measureless. All sin, there, there's, there is no graph sitting in heaven that says, oh, oh, sin, oh man, he murdered somebody, but this guy, he just took a cookie. So, I mean, I'll forgive him that, but he's going to need to do a couple things before I can forgive him of that. That's not how it works. All sin has no measure. It's all one solid straight line all across the board. Sin is sin no matter what, and all sin is worthy of death. It's, it's all, it all needs to be paid through the price of death. And Jesus Christ paid that price so we don't have to. Um, we need to realize that God's forgiveness clears all sin. Because there is no measurement of sin, because all sin is sin, that means God can forgive all sin. That's how it works. Um, and we need to realize that God's forgiveness was shown at the cross. We also need to be forgiving as Christ forgave us. We need to forgive the same way Christ forgives, which means our forgiveness towards others around us should have no limits. It should not be limited to, oh, okay, it was, it was just a pencil, no big deal, we'll, we'll call it good. That, that should be the exact same as someone who may have betrayed you. It's not easy. It's not. But that's how our forgiveness should be. Because God forgave us even though we betrayed him multiple times through our sin. Our, our forgiveness towards others should move past the hurt. Yes, it will hurt sometimes. It's going to hurt. But it should be able to move past that hurt and press forward into that relationship together with Christ around you with the other believers who are also having that same relationship with Christ. And we need to realize that our forgiveness is because of the forgiveness we were shown at the cross. We cannot truly understand true forgiveness without the truth. Jesus is the truth. He said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Without Jesus Christ, you cannot understand forgiveness. Without salvation, you cannot comprehend forgiveness because you have not received that forgiveness. Our forgiveness towards others should be a reflection of God's forgiveness so that they can see that Jesus, Jesus' forgiveness is true forgiveness. Um, verse 10 reads that if we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar and his word is not in us. You are perfect. If through trials, you learn and can teach others so that they can avoid the trials you've experienced. Although we've been forgiven, yes, we have still sinned. And we can't ignore this sin. We don't have to live in that sin, but we should learn from that sin. We should be able to take that sin that we have experienced, learn from the lessons that we have gained through it, and be able to sh share these lessons with the others so that others don't fall into the exact same sin that we have. <clears throat> Maybe you feel as if you're beyond saving. That's, that's a lie. It's, it's a lie exactly from sin. It's what sin wants you to think. If you think that your sin is too much, that you can't be saved, that's exactly where sin wants you to be. Um, sin has no measure, and God's grace has no limit. It doesn't matter what you've done. You may feel way off the deep end, way beyond saving, beyond God's reach, but in reality, you're just one step away from salvation. The only thing you must do is confess your sin and believe that God has died for you. Believe that God has taken on that sin so that you don't have to. You're just one step away from salvation. And His grace has no limits. Maybe you are saved, but you feel trapped by the guilt of sin. Sin hurts. 
Honestly, sin causes piercings in your life. You may be hurt by sin. You may have been pierced by sin, got these holes of sin in your life. But the reality is, if you are saved, take the time to look at the hands that are holding you because he has holes too. He took the holes of sin so that we don't have to. If you are pressed with this guilt, look beyond the sin. Look to the cross. Look to Christ. Because Christ took on the sin so that you don't have to continue living in sin. Confess your sin. If you confess your sin, God is faithful. God is righteous. God will forgive your sin. And he will cleanse you from all unrighteousness. It's a clean slate. You don't have to live in this. Because if you continue to live in your sin, you can't move forward in your walk with Christ. And that's just where the devil wants you. That's where he wants you to be. Because if you can't move past your sin, if you can't continue your walk with Christ, then you can't reach anybody else to Christ. And that's the job that God has given us. That is the job that we here at Warsaw strive to do. We go, we make disciples. We baptize the disciples, and we teach them to make disciples. If you're living in your sin, you can't do that. That's really, that's, that's, that's what it is. I don't know where you're at today. I don't know what you were feeling. I don't know how your sin is pressing on you, but you don't have to live there. Be better ahead and close your eyes with me. God, I don't know where these people are at. I, I don't know where they lie on their, their walk with you, Lord. Maybe they're trapped by sin. Lord, help them realize they don't have to live there. They don't have to live in their sin because you took it for them. Lord, you don't want them to live in their sin. You died so that they don't have to. So God, show them that. Lord, guilt. Guilt is, is hard. <coughs> It's hard, but we don't have to live there, God. You have died so that we don't have to live there. And that's the biggest thing. Help us realize that. Help us realize that when we sin, we can be forgiven. We can be forgiven because of the price that you pay. But we ask this all in your name. If you guys will stand with us, we're going to sing and trust and obey. And if you have, if you if you feel the calling of the Holy Spirit, whatever it is, mark it on your Connect card. There, there, you can come up, talk to me about it. You can, there are places up here you can uh, pray about it. But don't leave today without making a decision. If God is calling you to make a decision today, don't leave without making that decision.